Hello, geography students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 7, Section 2, The History of the Region. And we're talking about Mexico and Central America. So as we go along, make sure you're following along and writing in the items that you need. And we're going to start by just kind of giving you a little overview. Uh, Mexico was first inhabited by Native American groups. And at a later time, a good portion of this region would be conquered by the Spanish. Uh, their soldiers conquered Native American groups and ruled over them. And a lot of times uh, we refer to these soldiers as conquistadors. And one of our first Native American groups that I want to mention are the Olmec. Uh, the Olmec were found kind of in this Isthmus region of Mexico, kind of on this map here, kind of this area that's in the orange. And they created giant sculptures of these heads, uh, which you see pictured below, which is kind of kind of interesting. These sculptures were either representations of their leaders or rulers, uh, or possibly even their gods. We also had other groups, and if we would move towards the Yucatan Peninsula, about 3,000 years ago, we had the Mayans. They formed a major civilization in this region, and at the height of the Mayan civilization, which was between the you know, 8300s to about the year 900, uh, they had built great cities. Uh, the Mayans also built pyramids, like you see below. So this is like a step pyramid. And probably often it was used for either sacrifices or uh, maybe for uh, their astronomers because they did study astronomy. Uh, they also perfected the use of mathematics by introducing the concept of zero as a placeholder. They also used a vigil simul system of counting that was basing their numbers basically on the concept of 20. Down in the corner, uh, down here, we have kind of this circular, it looks kind of like a plate, but it's actually um, a representation of a Mayan calendar uh, that was probably based on, you know, the stars and, and uh, the position of the moon and such. Uh, but these little icons that you see in here are probably kind of like either the seasons or if you would call them like months, uh, so that people could keep track of time. The Aztec, uh, they're going to rule over central central uh, Mexico starting around the 80 1300s or the what would be like in Europe the Middle Ages. Uh, they had a very social complex social and also religious system. Many of the people that lived here were skilled farmers and they created a capital that was known as Tenochtitlan, uh, which was built around 1345 uh, in what is now today probably Mexico City. Uh, but it was like a, a swampy uh, island in the middle of a lake. And it had these wonderful uh, causeways. These are like bridges that kind of go from the mainland inland to the lake. In 1519, Hernan Cortez, who was a Spanish conquistador, came to Mexico and he entered Tenochtitlan where he was welcomed and he was worshiped as a great god known as Quetzalcoatl. Uh, Quetzalcoatl, you kind of see the rendition pictured here, but he was expected to return to his people roughly the year 1519. And what dumb luck that Cortez had. Uh, he happened to come at this time when this god was going to come and Quetzalcoatl was represented as a fair-skinned, bearded god uh, who left, had left his people uh, to go to the east and promising to return in the year 1519. Uh, how interesting how history kind of coincided uh, with this event that uh, when Cortez came, many of the Aztecs saw him as their god, and thus he was not to be feared. Uh, the horses that you see pictured below, this is the first time horses had entered the New World. And what's interesting is um, the horse itself, many of the, the Aztecs saw it as like a dragon. And that when the rider was on the horse, the horse and the dragon were all, or the horse and the rider were all one, you know, to, uh, entity that was to be feared like a dragon. All right. Within two years, the Spanish had defeated uh, the Aztec and they made their empire a Spanish colony. Spain became rich and competed, completely transformed the lives of the Mexican people. Uh, they sent missionaries to construct uh, outposts of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they were also um, 
set up so that priests could come to learn the language of the native people and also to teach them Spanish and to convert them to Catholicism. Um, below here, you see some different pictures of early churches that were constructed in parts of uh, Central America and also into Mexico. And number seven, in 1810, uh, the fight for Mexican independence began when a priest named Miguel Haldego uh, began a rebellion to win independence from Spain. By 1821, Mexico had gained its independence, but throughout the 1800s, the country experienced a lot of political conflict and the people remained very poor. And this is going to set Mexico up for um, some uncertainty. By the 1840s, some of what was Mexico, which is now part of present day Texas, uh, had seceded. And what's going to take place is a war between the United States and Mexico. Uh, in the 1840s, this war was fought over land that would eventually become the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and parts of California. And they even as far north, if you take a look at this map, as far north as Colorado, um, all that territory is going to go into the hands of the United States. Uh, we do pay for some of this as a result of some of the treaties that are forged right after the war with Mexico. But uh, needless to say, that's going to lead to some political instability in Mexico that's going to cause some problems as we go forward. So in number nine, this sat uh, this sat satisfaction uh, was spread uh, widespread throughout Mexico and a revolution erupted again in around the early 1900s. Emmanuel Zapata uh, was a tenant farmer from the southern part of Mexico, and he fought for almost a decade for the simple idea that the land belonged to the people and not the powerful landowners. He was considered to be a hero of the native people of Mexico. Revolutionaries also fought for land reforms in Mexico, and these people were known as Zapatists, and they still are protesting. As you see below, there are some people that have the uh, bandanas over their face or maybe what looks like a, a stocking cap over their heads. Uh, they are still out there fighting for land reforms, for public schools, and a new constitution, but they haven't had a lot of success. In number 10, in Central America, the Mayans had flourished uh, in Guatemala and also Belize, uh, starting around the year 250 to about 900. Spain gained control of some of this land in Central America by the 1560s and established colonies. In 1821, many of these colonies declared their independence from Spain and formed the United Provinces of Central America in 1923. And if you look below, that includes parts of Mexico, uh, Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. Um, so Great Britain claimed uh, what is now Belize in the 1800s. It did not gain its independence until 1981. Uh, the people of Belize today still speak English uh, and still have some ties there to uh, the former British colony. And number 11, El Salvador has been riddled by civil war, uh, really beginning in the 1980s through the beginning of the 1990s due to rich families owning much of the best farmland while most of the people lived in poverty. Nicaragua had um, different groups. The Sandinistas were a leftist group, a group that kind of favored communism, and they toppled the government in 1979 and began immediate reforms to help the poor under the leadership of a man named uh, Daniel Ortega. Uh, the U.S. began to fund a counter-revolutionary group in Nicaragua known as the Contras. And this led to a big political scandal in the United States uh, because there were some Americans that were upset when they found that our government was sending weapons and military personnel uh, to Nicaragua to help the Contras and to, to defeat the, the Sandinistas, thinking that this was going to lead to a, a bigger war. Number nine or number 13, Costa Rica, unlike its neighbors, has lived in peace due to its stable democracy. So it's uh, it's had a very normal and probably stable life. Uh, and number 14, Panama is the southernmost country in Central America. And the Panama Canal was completed in 1914. It was actually 
begun back in the, the 1880s, 1890s, um, but work stopped. And actually, it had been begun by the French government, but it stopped because of uh, problems with malaria and yellow fever. Uh, by 1904, the government had figured out ways to eradicate mosquitoes, and thus the United States uh, continued to work on this until about 1914 when the canal opened. Uh, today, it connects basically the Pacific Ocean to the Caribbean Sea, and it was primarily built by the United States. Uh, the canal was handed back to the people of Panama back in 1999, and so now it's in the hands of the Panamanian people. In 2016, a new set of locks was opened to allow the new Neo Panamex cargo ships. Those are the ones that are about um, three football fields long uh, to pass through the canals. So it's the canal is adapted so that it can basically meet the needs of our future. In number 15, Caribbean islands have also had a great cultural diversity uh, because they were all once colonies of several European countries. In 1492, Columbus had discovered the Caribbean islands for Spain. And Spain had little interest in the Caribbean, but the English and the French and also the Dutch were interested in this region. A lot of it has to do with trade. Uh, between the 1600s and the 1700s, colonies uh, established huge plantations for sugarcane. Uh, this is kind of going along with the, the triangular trade that was happening between Europe and Africa and also the uh, Western Hemisphere of North America primarily. Uh, the original laborers of these plantations came from the Caribbean, but exposure to European diseases led to the importation of African slaves. Haiti gained its independence when uh, Toussaint La Overture who was a former slave, helped Haiti gain its independence from France, and he became the first governor of this new nation. And it was the first time that um, basically one of these European colonies, aside from the United States, had gained independence uh, within the new world. And what's interesting, it was a former enslaved person who led this charge for independence. And number 17, Cuba and Puerto Rico remained under Spanish control until 1898 when Spain lost the Spanish-American War between the United States and Spain. Puerto Rico came under uh, U.S. or American control, and Cuba has been a communist country since 1959, following a revolution where this man named Fidel Castro, who you see pictured down below, seized power. Castro passed away a number of years ago, uh, but Cuba today is still a communist country. In number 18, the Caribbean islands in general have had few natural resources and require a lot of financial aid from countries that had once colonized them. Traditional foods in this area are corn, hot peppers, tomatoes, uh, cocoa, and then which is actually a source of chocolate. Thank you very much.